when you get into flipping houses, being able to actually evaluate the property before you buy is such a crucial part and is the part that's going to save you tens of thousands of dollars. And it's also a part that many people get it wrong. So you may be thinking, but I use the 70% formula and you think that's enough. We're going to cover the 70% formula and we're going to cover how that can be wrong if you're using the wrong numbers. In this episode, I'm going to be sharing with you all the mistakes that we have made while flipping houses, as well as the seven steps that you must know in order to buy right and for the right price. So with that being said, let's get into the show. At an investor's journey, we are striving to make sure people are investing in real estate the right way. This is why we share with you all of the strategies, tactics, and tips, everything that we are learning as real full-time real estate investors like this video right here. And in doing all of this, our hopes is that you get into real estate and you invest the right way, which means that you stay in real estate and you make money in real estate. This is why we cover every area of wholesaling, flipping, buy and hold, lending, borrowing money, everything that it is that you need to know to become successful. So if you are finding value throughout this video, make sure you give us that thumbs up because it helps us out so much and it means so much to us. It shows that you really care and you enjoy the information. As always, I'm your host, John Barbera, and this is part of the series that we're doing on flipping houses the right way in 2021. So you can check out the series by clicking up here. You can also check out the series uh, in the description below if you're listening on podcasts. Click the link below. You can check out the whole series. We're going to keep adding to it. We're going to be covering everything about flipping contractors, scopes of work. We, I mean, everything, everything. We're going to be providing you with uh, downloadable cheat sheets with uh, a bunch of things, guides, and everything that you can use as you go. All of these things are for free. So make sure you are hitting that subscribe button, you're hitting that bell notification so you don't miss another video. And if you're interested in more content like this about flipping houses, renovating, managing contractors, make sure you text the word flip to 210-794-9898. And I will make sure to get you insider tips and information in real time solely to you. These are things that it just takes us a while to be able to create a video on. But in our text community, we are sending these out almost every day, tips and stuff as they are ha happening in real time. So make sure to text FLIP to 210-794-9898. Look, usually the biggest mistake a lot of investors are making when it comes time to flipping houses and rehabbing houses is that they become motivated buyers. All right. This is one by far one of the biggest mistakes. And if you want to know what is the biggest mistakes that we've made and that others are making, make sure you stick to the end as I'm going to share with you by far the biggest one that will solve all of these problems. But with that being said, if you truly want to reach any level, I mean, truly any level of success in this business, then you must be able to remove emotions from this business. OK, this is a business houses, everything. There are numbers that you must analyze. All right. This is not an opinion. This is not hunches. There's an actual science to flipping and rehabbing houses. All right. And there is a little mixture between science and art, but the majority of it, where the people are losing the most money is in the science part of it. And that's what we're going to discuss. But before we get into that, like, I just want to share with you how you got to eliminate emotions and you do this by making sure that you become calm, cold, and calculated. All right. So what do I mean by this? Never feel like you must get into flipping houses as soon as possible or else everything will go to hell, right? Everything will for sure go to hell if you get into the wrong flip. A lot of people have that fear of missing out. You feel like you see real estate right now. It's going through the roof. Everything's going, this person's flipping, that person. Everything is selling. You know, prices are going through the roof. I got to get in right now. No, relax. Real estate is not going away, okay? I, I'm, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but relax. It's not going away. 
It's not going out of style. People still need a roof over the head and they're always going to need a roof over the head. So while that is, real estate is always going to make sense. One thing that you can never get back is the amount of money that you can lose if you rush into this. So you must stay calm. Cold. What do I mean by you got to be cold is don't get roped into the social media hype, whatever the news is saying, whatever somebody is saying at your local networking event. You must do what works for you. So what do I mean by this? There's so many times that you're chasing Airbnbs, right? Because it's trendy, it's hot, it's cool. Or maybe you're chasing, you know, I want to do notes, I want to do flips, I want to do historic homes or this or that, because that's what you see. You're seeing people doing it. You're seeing, you know, maybe some hype about it, or maybe you're hearing on the news that's like, oh my God, real estate, you know, investors are crushing it right now in real estate or real estate is about to start tanking or crashing or whatever it is. You got to be cold. You got to be able to, as that information hits you, take it just as it is. It's just words. All right. It's information. Now you got to take that information and classify it within your goal, within your purview of what makes sense. So don't get into flipping houses just because it's trendy or just because it will make you look cool on social media. Be cold about this and calculated. I need you to be calculated by making sure that you know your numbers and you trust the numbers, not your hunch, not that you're hopeful, nothing. Trust the numbers, okay? If the numbers are showing you that this is going to be a very marginal deal, it's going to be a tight deal, makes it a no deal, you don't get into it, all right? Don't get optimistic just because everything is going up. Well, it doesn't make too much sense now, but you know, by the time I, I go ahead and list, it's going to be higher. That's exactly how you get into trouble because, I'm sorry, if you didn't come from the future, Right? If you're not Marty McFly and you're not pulling up in that DeLorean, you don't know what tomorrow brings. And this market can shift on a dime. Even though real estate takes a minute to adapt, if anything drastic happens, and we've seen it, drastic things can happen from one day to the next, your whole investment and your whole strategy can go to crap. So if you were barely marginal when you were getting in, you're probably negative at this point. So don't do it. There's no reason why you should be losing money in real estate at all. So now let's get into the actual nuts and bolts of the seven things that you must know in order to flip the right way, to buy the right house, and to always make sure you're making money. That is the whole point of flipping houses. If you're not going to make money, don't get into it. Step number one. I've said this in so many episodes and it just, it's the biggest one and it's the biggest one that almost everybody gets wrong consistently is know your market. Okay. Know your market. What is the speed of the market right now? What do I mean by speed of the market? What are the months of inventory? How fast are houses selling? This is going to determine your holding costs. This is going to determine so many things as to what you are going to do with the property. If it's very, very low months of inventory, the market is red hot like it is right now in San Antonio or many areas of the U.S., there's a lot of times that means that you don't have to do as many repairs it, or the quality doesn't have to be that high of the materials that you're putting in the cabinets, floors, stuff like that. Those things matter because that at the end of the day is going to affect the bottom line. But if you don't understand where the market is, you're not going to understand what it is that you got to do. Also, understanding where the market is means you understand which price points are the hot ones. So what is that those price points that are just flying off of the shelf? All right. You the reason you want to focus on these price points is because you want to focus on the biggest buyer pool. You don't want to target a price point that is just because it's close to your home or maybe it's the type of house that you would like or whatever it is and the buyer pool is so much smaller because when there's a small buyer pool it's supply and demand when there's a small demand for your supply it makes people pickier it takes longer to sell you might have to spend more money on the rehab so you want to make sure you're targeting a price point that is very desirable all right and that becomes with knowing your market along with this is what areas of town are the hot ones? 
What areas of town are people moving to? And this is going to help you understand your market even further because it's going to show you, well, why are they moving there? Is it just because of price, right? They want affordability or is it because of job opportunity? Are they closer to a certain uh, employer, uh, something that's growing? What's going on? What's driving people to that side of town versus this side or this other side? Now, why all that helps is because a lot of times, even though this little section of your town is red hot, right? Maybe the outskirts are a great place to invest in. Because if it's red hot, that means properties are flying off the shelf. People can't get to them right away. You know, FHA buyers are being bid out left and right. So what do they do? They still want proximity. So they might actually move to the outskirts of that area. And that area might have a lot less competition for you. So now you can get into uh, maybe the outskirts of that. But if you don't know even where the hot points are, you're definitely not going to know where the outskirts are. And the last thing you want to know about knowing your market is once you've determined, all right, the hot areas, these are the areas I'm going to be focused on. This is the price point I'm going to be focused on. This is why all this. Now you want to determine what is the quality of those houses. So what is the quality of the houses that are selling in those areas for that price at that speed? What's that quality look like? Are we talking about high-end upgrades? Are we talking about the house just needs to be clean? Are we talking about Home Depot cabinets versus more custom tailor cabinets? And trust me, not every house is the same. Not every area sells the same way. So you got to see, and you do this by running comps. So if you click right up here or you check the description below, I'm actually going to put a link to the series that I did on how to run comps, how it is that we run comps. So you want to make sure you're running comps correctly. And obviously by comps, I mean comparables, houses that compare, houses that are selling. Um, you want to make sure you're running comps correctly and determining all, right, all these houses that are selling for that max price point, what quality of work do they have? Is it carpeting everywhere? Is it high-end laminate or just regular laminate? Or all these houses just clean, right? Yeah, they're dated, but nobody seems to care. They're selling just as fast. That matters because if you're not every house needs to be renovated and not every house needs to be renovated to the top of its market. So know your market, know the data. Number two, know the actual true repairs that must be done to the property. This means plumbing, electrical, foundation, roof, landscaping. One thing to keep in mind, like let's take electrical for example. Just because the electrical is working does not mean it doesn't need to be updated. All right. We found houses, we bought houses that the electrical works just fine, but it was so dated that if somebody's to buy it now, that the panels that they have in place would not be able to keep up with the technology people have nowadays. People have TVs in every room, they're running computers, they're running so many things at the same time that these older panels cannot handle it, right? So it's like, yes, the electrical does work, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't need to be updated. And this is something that can cost you so much money. And it's the same with the roof. It may not be leaking, but it might still be need to be updated. Right. That means that buyers are probably not going to pay for that house with such an old roof and the foundation. Most definitely, if the foundation is messed up, they're not going to get approval. So you must must understand what the true repairs are. And within determining what the true repairs are is understanding, well, if I do this, what will this do to that? So what do I mean? If I fix the foundation, what will the foundation do to the plumbing? What would the foundation do to maybe the door frames, right? How much am I lifting? You got to start thinking more steps ahead, right? It's not just, oh, I fixed the foundation and we're done. No, because if you're lifting, especially in San Antonio, if you're doing a foundation and you're lifting more than like two inches, three inches, and where you're lifting is where all the plumbing is, chances are you might break plumbing, okay? And that's going to be a couple more extra thousand dollars that you're going to have to spend to fix that plumbing depending on how bad it's cracked. So all of these things, if you start doing one thing, what else would that one thing affect? 
try to think a little bit deeper than just that surface level because those are the areas that you're going to get into trouble. You're going to this is why we always say don't open up a wall cuz you don't know what's behind it. Now you're forced to fix the whole thing. And it's not to avoid problems, it's just don't move a wall if it doesn't need to be moved, right? A lot of people are always going in, "Oh, let's tear this wall. Let's open this up. Let's do that." Well, relax. You know, let's look at the electrical, let's look at the layout, let's look at the plumbing. Does it make sense to do all that? And if we do it, what does that mean for this or for that or for this other area? The house needs to flow, lights, light switches. I mean, so many things matter. So think through all of these things. If you're walking into a house and we were to move this wall, where's the light switch going to go now? And do we need to put one here and on the other side of the room? All of these things, very important. Another thing that that's affects your repairs is the materials. So right, especially right now, we're having a shortage on so many things. So if you're renovating a house, are the materials available? Let's say you say, oh, I need Home Depot cabinets. Are they available? Is the flooring you wanted to put available? And if it's not, are you going to order it and wait maybe three, four weeks, however long it might take for you to get that material? Or are you going to spend more money and buy maybe a higher end material just because they have that one in stock? Do you see how this is going to affect your budget? So even if you say, well, I'll buy the same material, I'll just wait. Okay, but that's three, four, five. I mean, we've had to wait north of eight weeks for doors. So that amount of time, if you can't progress without those materials, that's time that you're just chewing up money costs, holding costs, everything. It's hurting you. You understand? So you got to determine like, is the time going to hurt me more or is paying more for a higher end material that's in stock going to hurt me more? What's going to be more beneficial to me in this project? You got to weigh your options. You got to see what makes the most sense. And like I said at the beginning, do what sells. Don't do what you feel in your gut. Don't do what, you know, makes you feel better. Do what is actually selling. All right. Run your comps, know your numbers and do what is selling. Don't get roped up and caught up with doing the pretties or the things that just might look cool on Instagram or Facebook. And it's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you labor. It's going to cost you time. And you're not going to get the return that you even thought you were going to get. Step number three. Know your timeline. Underestimating the timeline of the project the repairs, all of this, it's the most common problem with most people. And why is this an issue? Timeline matters so much because of your holding costs, your money costs. But more than that, it's going to matter on how you schedule and set up your contractors, on whether or not you are going to order material or you're going to buy what's in stock, on whether or not you're going to sell at a peak time in the year or you're going to sell, you know, in the middle of the winter where it's slower. So knowing your timeline on any project is very, very crucial. It's very important to the project itself. And this is something that we always see people time and time get this wrong because they're more, they're focusing on the wrong things and they assume timeline, right? Somebody comes in and says, oh, it's going to be this or it's going to be that. And it's like, oh, okay, fine. No, not fine. You know, if you don't know what the hell it is, well, this is our rule of thumb. If a contractor comes and tells you a time, double it. All right? Always double it. Why? Because chances are you're going to need to double it. <laughs> if they're telling you four weeks, it's probably going to be closer to six to eight weeks. All right? If they're telling you four months, it's likely going to be closer to seven to eight months. It, it's just what it is. I, a lot of contractors, and we covered this on a, on a previous video on, you know, be, why you don't want to partner with your contractors and what to do if you decide to, we covered all that. And you can find the link up here or in the description, I'll put the link to that video as well. But in that video, we covered all the problems and usually contractors just don't, are not very good at staying on task, on target and doing things at the right, at the needed amount of time that they said they were going to do. So this, all of this hurts you because if one contractor delays a few days and it pushes back your other contractor, that other contractor is going to go get another job in the meantime, because they got to eat. And then by the time you're ready, that contractor is busy. So now you got to wait another week or so until they can fit you into the schedule. And that throws off your other contract. I mean, 
the timeline is everything. You understand? The timeline matters so, so much. And then again, holding costs, everything. A lot of loans have extension periods. So if you surpass a certain amount of time, now you got to pay an extra point or two or whatever the agreement is. That's going to cost you more money. You got to know your timeline. Another thing that really affects timeline is permits. If you're dealing with the city and you got to pull permits. There are times that, you know, this area communicates with this area or doesn't communicate with that area. And you got to ask for this. You got to ask for that. And that can, that's a week for this, three weeks for that. Uh, you know, the inspector came in and whatever stubbed their toe in the morning and didn't pass your inspection. All of these things can delay you weeks. All right. Because anything dealing with the city is not days. It's weeks. So anything you're doing permits, you're doing anything like that. You got to figure out like, all right, these permits that we need to pull, this thing that we need to do, how much time is it going to take? You understand? So you got to figure that out. You got to, and don't be optimistic. Never be optimistic with these things because they never are. So don't be optimistic. Understand what that means and how long that takes. If you live in the San Antonio area, you want to make sure you text property tour to 210-794-9898 and you will get alerted every time we are setting up to go to a property, check out one of our projects, analyze another deal. We will let you know. You can tag along and ask us any questions you want. So text property tour to 210-794-9898. Step number four, who are your buyers for this property? Who's going to be buying this house? Is it going to be somebody with an FHA loan, VA loan, conventional cash, cash? These things matter, right? FHA buyers, if that's primarily your buyer pool in that area, you got to hold the house at least 90 days for it to qualify for FHA financing. Because if not, you can't accept any offers. They have a rule. You got to qualify for FHA financing and it, you must hold the house for at least 90, 91 days. You got to hold the house for. So that matters. VAs, you know, they, they have a lot of stipulations, a lot of things that that becomes in the loan process. It becomes a pain in the butt. Sometimes it takes a longer time to actually get the funding or to actually do the closing. So the closing costs are going to be different, right? A lot of FHA buyers or VAs, they don't even have any money to come to closing. So they're going to ask for higher concessions. So they have the money. Um, you also have the closing time could be a lot longer. You have all of these things that are going to matter because it affects closing time, closing costs, concessions. All of these things affect your money and affect the profit you're going to be making. Now, are they conventional? Are they cash buyers? Does the appraisal matter? So right now we're in a market that's so crazy. It's so hot that we're having properties listed at what the value is. And you're getting 10% over ask on offers. Now, a lot of people are saying, wow, that's amazing. 10% over ask. Yes. But if it doesn't appraise, that means that if it, the appraisal doesn't say, no, it's not worth that much. Who's going to make that difference? Are you going to have to calm down, uh, calm down and take the offer you initially had or whatever appraised for, or are they waiving the appraisal? Meaning that it doesn't matter what it appraised for, they're going to come in with the extra cash. These things matter. These things matter because if those are part of your exit strategy and the money you're going to be making and everything, you need to know who you're targeting. Number five, and this one, uh, as funny as it seems, it's something that a lot of people don't take very serious and it gets them into a lot of trouble, is know your financing. What do I mean? Are you using hard money, private money? cash. What are the points? What is the interest? What are the extension fees on it? Do you know these numbers? Do you know what that money is costing you on a daily basis? Why daily? Because any delay, anything that you have is going to cost you money. So if it delays three days, that's three days that it costs you money. So you have to know. I have, I ask investors all the time when they're coming to me and they have a property that maybe they're getting into trouble or whatever. And I ask them, I'm like, all right, what's your financing look like? Oh, um, it's a hard money loan. I'm like, okay, what are the points in the interest? Um, hmm. I think it was, what? What do you mean you think it was? You understand? Like, this is your financing. This is not a joke. <laughs> you know, you're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars. 
over a hundred thousand dollars, depending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on what houses you're buying. So how do you not know what you owe? How do you not know what the payoffs are? You need to understand your finances because if you want to sell, maybe you got into a little bit of trouble, you want to liquidate, or maybe, you know, you're getting towards the end and you want to go ahead and list it. You need to know what is your profit going to even be? And if you don't know what your finances are, if you don't know what your financing is, how are you going to determine whether you're pricing it right, you're doing enough, or you're going to make enough money? I don't think you can. So you got to make sure you understand your financing, the draws. If you're doing hard money or anything that requires draws, how do the draws cost more? How often are they going to do it? Do you got to front the money first? You understand? Like these are all things you got to ask. You got to understand. You got to understand the whole process. Everything that's going to cost you money, you must know and you must understand. Number six, this is something that a lot of people actually don't really calculate or know about is know your profit versus risk. What do I mean by this? Is that a lot of people get into flipping houses with the simple 70% uh, formula. What is the 70% formula is you find the after repair value, the ARV, right? That is the max value a house is going to sell for. And you subtract 30% from that. And that 30%, what that is going to equal to is your profit plus your closing costs roughly. And then what's left, you're going to minus repairs. All right. So that is that 30% minus the repairs is going to give you your maximum allowable offer. So that's what a lot of people base their offers on. So they take that 30%. This is why it's called a 70% formula because, you know, 100 <laughs> minus 30 is 70. So you take the 30% that includes your profit and your costs, and it leaves you with that net. So that out of that net is where you subtract your repairs, and that's what your offer is. Not every deal needs to fit the formula. There's a lot of times that an 80 plus percent deal could still make sense for a flip, right? Because maybe it's something that's very quick. Maybe it's something that's higher end. So the profit is much greater on it. Maybe it's very low risk. Maybe it's all the above. So what does this all mean is you got to determine how much capital am I risking and I'm putting at risk. What is the level of that risk? on this project versus the profit I can stand to make on this. So if you are risking, let's say $200,000 to make $15,000, you're saying, oh, I don't know. I'm not sure if I want to take that level of risk or something like that. And it's like, well, what if that risk is very minimal because you have the data, you have everything, and all you got to do to the house is just clean it up. Maybe some light touch-up here and there, and you put it on the market and it's in a hot price point, it's in a hot area, and it's going to sell within, a, within two days. Now it's like, do you want to make 15 grand in two days? Right? So these things matter. You got to, that's why when a lot of people tell me, oh, well, what do you look for? What's your formula? I'm like, I don't have a formula. I look at the actual deal because I calculate all of my costs. I calculate what my selling cost is, what the listing fees are going to be, what my repairs are going to be, all my, my holding cost is going to be on the money. I calculate everything. And once I calculate everything, that's where I submit my offer. I don't care where that comes in at. Is it 70%, 80%, 60%? I don't care because those are my numbers. That is based on the level of risk and the level of profit, what I'm willing to pay. So you must understand this. What is the profit versus the risk that you got to take to gain that profit? Now, if I got to risk a lot more capital, take a lot longer to make the same 15 grand, I'm more likely not to do that deal because there's more variables here of risk that can go wrong and that 15 grand can disappear just like that. So you must, must understand that what is the profit versus the risk. Finally, step number seven is know all of your numbers and the actual numbers. All right. So this is exactly how we analyze our deals and the, the numbers that we run and all the things that we factor. First of all, you want to start with ARV. You have to repair value. You want to make sure you're being conservative with that ARV. 
Right now, again, in San Antonio, we have a really hot market. It's houses you're listing for, you know, 200 and it's selling for 210, 215. Okay. You can't buy it thinking that. You can't buy it saying, okay, yeah, my air, based on the comps, the ARV is 200, but I know I can get 215. No, you don't know. You're hoping you can get 215. Yes, there's things showing that you might get 215, but you don't know that you're going to get 215. What is the comp? 200. If you can't make that deal work at 200, don't do it. Because if for whatever reason, by the time you're done, it doesn't go for 215 and you couldn't make it work at 200, now you're negative. But if you can make it work at 200, 215, cherry on top. So always, always be conservative with your ARV. Do not be optimistic. All right. That is exactly when you start negotiating, you start, and this is just emotions. It's not facts and it's not numbers. You're not being cold, you're not being calm, and you're not being calculated. These are the things I told you to make sure you're doing. So if you're not doing that, now you're being emotional and you're hoping for the best. Don't hope. Don't leave your fate and your money in the hands of an appraiser that might or may not agree with your valuation or their offer. I mean, don't hope for any of those things. Go for what is, all right? What is, is that is the comp, that is the price. Then from there, you want to start subtracting what everything is going to be. So let's say like your sales terms, right? You want to subtract concessions or when you look at comps, are houses selling with any concessions? In a really hot market, they really aren't. Uh, agent fees. We have an agent, John, John Barr, he's our, my business partner and he's the agent for Prime Home. So he lists all of our properties and he has a very low flat fee that he lists for. Because he's the agent and he's a part owner of the property. So he lists for a very low flat fee. So now instead of being 6%, we're paying less than 3% right now for listing our properties. That affects your profit. So you got to understand like, am I using, you know, am I paying for a listing agent and for a buyer's agent or is it just one agent? What am I paying for? You got to factor in that number. What are your closing costs going to be? You know, your title costs, everything. What is all of that going to cost? Are you speaking to your title company? Do you know what it's going to cost for that particular house selling for that price? Know those numbers. So you want to subtract that. And then one thing that a lot of people always forget, and it's not included in the 70% formula, is your money cost. This is if you're getting hard money, private money, whatever it is. What is that money going to cost you? Remember, if you know your timeline, now you know how much money you got to borrow and how long you're going to hold it for. So you got to pay that, right? You got to pay that back. So what is that cost going to be at the end of the project? So this is a number, seriously, so many people do not account for. They do the 70% minus repairs, boom, here it is. And then it's always, <laughs> I always have that question. And I'm like, well, what about your money cost? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, that's coming out of your profit now. You understand? Now, a deal that might have been marginal became even less than marginal. What is your money cost? Subtract that. Your repairs, the true repairs. What is your labor? What is your materials? What is staging, pictures, getting the house professionally cleaned? What are all these things going to add up to? Getting, it, getting professional pictures, getting it staged, getting it professionally cleaned. These are things that really add up. Landscaping, just mowing the lawn maintaining the lawn. These are things that add up. You got to understand this. This is all part of your repairs budget. What are all these things going to cost? Do you know the true numbers or everything? Because you now got to subtract your repair cost. And lastly, your potential profit. What is the profit that you feel is adequate for the level of risk on this deal? So based on your repairs, based on the time of market, based on your buyer pool, based on all this, what is the minimum amount of money that you would want to make on this deal? Right. So this is where that matters. It's like, well, because it's low risk, I'm, I'm fine walking away with maybe 20 grand, 15 grand, whatever it may be. Or no, this is a high risk. I'm not doing this for any anything under 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars, whatever it may be. You got to determine that you got to understand them because you also got to understand your level of risk. So if you're doing a house that's, let's say, two hundred thousand dollars and anything goes wrong and you have a fifteen thousand dollar profit. $15,000 could potentially cover most of the wrong things 
where you could, at the worst case, kind of break even if you determine the repairs and everything correctly and something out of the normal just happened, right? 15 grand usually covers it. 15 grand on a $500,000 home, it's not going to do anything. You understand? On that, you need a bit, much, much bigger profit because anything goes wrong in a $500,000 home, you got to do a price drop, you got concessions, whatever it is, you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars. So you need to determine what does that profit need to be based on that risk. So the bonus that I promised you, you want to avoid all of these issues guaranteed or damn near close to guaranteed, then what you want to do is partner. Find somebody local that is doing the rehabs and the flips in the areas that you are looking at. So if you're doing historic homes and the investor that you know doesn't do historic homes, don't partner with them because it's probably just as risky. So partner with investors that are doing the types of homes that you have access to or that you're about to buy, partner with them. Yes, you do have to split your profit and all of this, but the level of risk just went almost negative. You understand? Because they have the experience. They have the knowledge. They know how to cover their ass. They're not going to take this on knowing that they got to split the profit with you and there's still risk that they're going to walk away with nothing. They're not going to do it. If they take it on, it's because they're going to make their money and you are going to make your money. And not only that, but you're going to make a wealth, a wealth of money through knowledge. You're going to learn so much. You're going to learn so much about the flip process. You're going to learn so much about managing, running the numbers, listing, everything that there is to learn and still make a good amount of money. So if you want to avoid all of these mistakes and you want to avoid any risk, you got to partner. Partner with somebody local that understands and that does that for a living. So I hope this video has been helpful and informational to you and bringing you the value that I'm hoping to bring to you guys. And if you want to find out more about the rest of the series on flipping houses and doing this the right way, make sure you click on the video up here and then you can click down here for just more training, more education. So thank you all for watching and I will catch you guys on the next one.